this week on the Backtable podcast. So historically, the awareness of IR among the public has been poor. Just 20 years ago, 2% of the public was able to identify IR as a medical specialty in the literature. And in 2004, 50% of patients who underwent an IR procedure were unaware that an IR actually performed the procedure. Another study in only 29% of patients who underwent an IR procedure could describe the procedure adequately. In 2023, in our study, we showed that 44% believed IR to be physicians and less than 40% believe that IR is a medical specialty. So although overall there's under-awareness and a lot of work needs to be done, I think overall the knowledge and recognition of our specialty is maturing. I think this is partially at least related to the IR residency and more emphasis on the clinical model and more recognition and more growth in our procedures. Welcome to the Backtable Podcast, your source for all things endovascular or otherwise minimally invasive. You can find all previous episodes of the podcast on iTunes, Spotify, or backtable.com. This is Mike Barraza as your host. I'm joined by my friend and former guest, Mina Macri from The Ohio State University. Hey, man. Hey, Mike. Uh, that's true. That's uh, The Ohio State. You have to have the The. It's important. That's uh, 100%. It's, it's learn a real that. pleasure. <laughs> Absolutely. It's a real pleasure to be back and... Uh, Thank you again for the opportunity. It's always fun uh, doing the podcast with you and the uh, Backtable family. So the study that we're talking about today has gotten a lot of buzz. You know, it was cited in a lot of radiology news outlets at the time. It was featured in Interventional News, Applied Radiology, Radiology Business, and Ant Mini. It was awarded a featured article recognition by JVIR, and so is now available for free, even if you don't have a subscription. And then it was chosen for a 2023 Distinguished Clinical Study Award. Today, we're going to talk about public awareness of interventional radiology. And you and I are both on call this weekend, and I can assure you that everybody in the hospital is aware of interventional radiology this weekend because I've treated nearly everyone. And so <laughs> there, there are no issues there. It seems like everybody is, is trying to call me for cases this weekend. How's your weekend been? So far, so good. <laughs> Man, I'm getting, I'm getting beat up, but that's the job. Yeah. No, I love my job and I love taking care of patients. So, um, you know, I always tell this to my residents, you know, the one thing about IR is that time flies by. So even if you're busy, that's a good problem to have. <laughs> totally. And look, like you, I have a big outpatient practice with a full clinic and I love seeing those patients and scheduling them, but I actually love emergency and, and inpatient and ER interventional radiology. I, I think those are some of the most fun cases. I, I told you earlier, I've had a, a fun but hard weekend, you know, a couple strokes, had a pulmonary artery pseudoaneurysm, a trauma, just did a bronchial. And, and those are some of my favorite cases. Oh, absolutely. Those are the cases where you have the potential to make the biggest impact. And a lot of these patients often don't have a lot of good options. So we definitely provide great value there, and I'm glad that you have the opportunity to uh, take care of those patients. Yeah, and a lot of them do have a lot of options, and I, I think one of the important things we're going to talk about is, is that maybe they're not always aware of those options. And what we're going to review is, is a, a paper that you published that was titled Public Awareness of Interventional Radiology, Population-Based Analysis of the Current State of and Pathways for Improvement. What made you want to do that, that study? So this topic is something that, that has always piqued my interest. Whenever I'm trying to explain you know, our specialty to others or even interactions with primary care and other specialties, most don't really know what I do and the spectrum of interventions that we can offer patients. And building on previous work I published in 2019, which evaluated PCP understanding of IR, I wanted to further evaluate IR awareness by looking at the perspective of the public. And that's what, how the study came all about. Tell me a bit how you put this together, how you decided where to look for the, the population that you were going to interview. Absolutely. So uh, there's not a lot of research that has taken place in this area. So this gives us uh, a lot of opportunity to, to explore. And I wanted to, to get a broad-based um, population. So the, the research that has been published over the last 20 years has been very limited and had drawbacks. So most of the studies have employed small sample sizes. They drew from patient population, specific patient populations, so new referrals to IRR patient clinics. Some were presented at conferences and published as abstracts, so not peer-reviewed, not higher-level research. And uh, we aim to address these limitations by looking at a larger and broader population using crowdsourcing. So there's always limitations with survey-based research, but and more work needs to be done, but this is the, the largest sample that we've had to date. 
And we wanted to look not at just patients getting IR care, but just the public in general. Exactly. So in other words, we wanted to not just look at our health systems patients, but the, the public sample. So we used the MTurk. And if you look at our data, we looked at participants from across the U.S. with diverse ages, races, gender, education, employment, socioeconomic status, income, and location, urban, suburban, ruler, health insurance type, prior knowledge of IR, and, uh, and all this is published there. And we wanted to get a diverse or public population as possible. And this has been validated in other studies using that approach of being a representative sample. Yeah, I think that's great that you interviewed not just patients, but the, the general public. I mean, obviously, people find out what IR is real quick when they need a procedure. Absolutely. But it's interesting, you know, you talk to your friends and, and people ask what you do. And there does seem to me to be a knowledge gap, at least in the population that I'm surrounded by. You know, people ask what I do and, and they can't ever get the name right. And we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that later, but they don't really grasp what it is that we do. And so one of my questions for you is going into this before you, you did this study, what were you expecting? Absolutely. So in my personal observations, like you, the public in general is not familiar with radiology in general, and most confuse radiologists with the technologists who obtain the scans. So most don't actually understand what a diagnostic radiologist does, let alone an interventional radiologist. And most folks or many folks don't, don't think an IR is a physician, in my opinion. And even if they do, they don't know what an IR does. And these were my day-to-day -day intera observations from interacting with the public. And interestingly, this study actually confirmed this and it showed even some interesting findings about this. So first... 44.4% believed interventional radiologists to be physicians. So that's less than 50% of the public that thinks that we're doctors. And then less than 40% identify IR as a medical specialty. So in general, the awareness is very low. And then the majority who, of those who identified IR as a medical specialty reported learning about IR from family or friends. So that's about 26%. Online sources, another 18%. PCPs, 17%. And contrast that with surgeons. So 85% of the respondents recognize surgery as a medical, uh, unique medical specialty. So even compared to other specialties, where there's a lot of under-awareness and under and understanding of IR. And then secondly, of those who could identify IR as a medical specialty, 43% had at least basic understanding of it, which you know we determined that based on understanding the difference between IR and DR, knowing that IR does procedures, et cetera. But when you stratify those patients, over half had experience in healthcare, and which itself is a factor for understanding IR. So nothing, you know, groundbreaking here. But when you exclude those with previous experience in healthcare, there was a significant correlation between having a basic understanding of IR and increasing level of education, but no correlation with age, income, residence, race. So across the board, regardless of your background other than education, there is lack of understanding or under-awareness of IR in general. Why? I mean, what do you think contributes to the, the lack of awareness of IR as a medical specialty and the fact that we're actually doctors? We are. <laughs> no, we are. Absolutely. So I think it's a, it's a multifactorial issue. I think IR being a relatively newer specialty with constantly evolving therapies, which are often abstract and hard to explain, uh, these therapies are, are difficult for some of our colleagues to comprehend, let alone patients without medical background. And for our colleagues and PCPs, exposure to IR is often limited in medical school, and it's, it's not an required rotation. Most don't have direct exposure to our specialty. And historically also, we did not have significant direct patient interaction before the advent of the IR clinic and the growth of the clinical model, which limited the public's understanding of what we do. And as a result of all that, patients don't always get the treatment options they can have. So it's not just a knowledge gap, it's also, it has implications. So for example, if you look at uterine fibroids, 70 to 80% of women have fibroids by age of 50. And UFI is a safe and effective alternative to, to hysterectomy and myomectomy, as we all know. It has, it's uterine preserving, it has quicker recovery, has less risks, and that's been well documented in research. But the number of women who get hysterectomy for uterine fibroids is 65% higher than women that undergo UFI. So this is a major issue, and patients also tell us that. So, for example, in this study, under-awareness affects patient decisions requiring, you know, regarding treatment, even when they are offered IR procedures. So in our work, 58% of the patients received the option to undergo a procedure performed by a surgeon. 
And ultimately, the 28 that opted for a surgeon to perform the procedure over IR, 70% of them reported lack of awareness of IR you know, playing a role in decision making. So even when patients are offered IR as an option, if they don't understand it and they're being told about it by other people who don't understand it completely, they still don't let go that route. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I think that's a really good point. You know, the the fact that IR is a relatively new field, but it's always changing. And I, I think one of the challenges is that there's always something new. You know, there's a, there's a new procedure that's come out, and you know that doesn't trickle down to the the community like more existing procedures does. But the other thing is that you know we are treating all over the body. You know, we're not a urologist who's focused on one area of the body. We're we're treating all over and it's probably harder that not a lot of us are established as I'm the cancer guy, like I am the MSK guy. It may be easier for them. But as you as you demonstrated that the lack of awareness does impact treatment decisions. Like you showed 92% of participants in your study would prefer a minimally invasive procedure and a very large proportion of those were unaware of IR's role in those interventions, right? Absolutely. So Yes. So the good news is that the patients want to know, uh, which is a good problem to have for us because it's fixable. So for patients, you know, given the choice between undergoing a minimally invasive procedure performed by an IR and a more traditional open surgery by a surgeon, almost 92% of the patients, you are correct, would prefer a minimally invasive procedure. And our data showed that the patients that had a prior IR procedure uh, those patients, about 48% of them had a basic understanding of IR and only 35% can describe the procedure. So so we need to do better. So even the patients that come to us, their understanding of our specialty is, is low. So how can we bridge the gap? So our results showed that short, less than 10-minute educational videos and increased patient education by PCPs were among the most preferred ways for the public to receive their awareness. And if you break it down, you're just looking at the first one, I think we need to continue building our online presence and social media presence to raise awareness. And these efforts can be personal. A lot of us, including you and others from Backtable and myself, have online presence and involvement with patient advocacy and, and et cetera. But there are also SIR campaigns to raise awareness, and, and we need to continue to support these initiatives. And this is not unique to us. Other specialties like vascular surgery have done research to show that social media is important in discussing patient options for various pathology and direct engagement by the physicians prove awareness. And regarding the second, which is, you know, the primary care awareness, we need to educate them. You know, I think we need to educate our PCP colleagues so they feel empowered to consult us and refer patients that may benefit from IR. In my prior study from 2019, the majority of PCPs, about 67%, learned the most about IR during residency, and 75% of those indicated they would like to learn more. So they're interested as well. So just like patients, they want to learn more. So we need to invite them to our meetings. We need to present in their meetings, not just in radiology meetings and SIR and IR meetings. And we need to give them lectures, grand rounds. We need to invite the residents to come in our space and do electives in IR and come to our clinics. So those are some of the, the ways we can address that. That was a very effective thing for me in my existing practice when I started was I gave a lecture to a group of primary care physicians and in, to an entire hospital of OBGYNs. And it was eye-opening. They, they, they had no idea. I tried to just make general picture of IR, what we do. And I tried to list like every single procedure by the type of part of the body and they're just stunned. And so I get from that, I get text and phone calls every week. It's like, do you guys do anything for this? Sometimes yes, sometimes no, but that was a really effective thing for me. Absolutely. I've been there too. And it's all about building relationships. Once people see what you can do and you know they have a good patient experience, those patients go back and they become your biggest advocate. And they also know that as you partner with, you know, I've noticed myself as well, as we partner with other specialties and PCPs, once they understand that we're there not to sell procedures, we're not there to, we're actually there to take care of patients and treat these processes. And, you know, they'll send me patients and some of them will say yes and some of them will say no, it's not a good candidate, but they see that I care, I communicate, I make sure I answer the patient's questions, or if we do a procedure, we manage them before and after, that goes a long way. Yeah, I'm with you. You know, when I, I go and, and pitch something like that, you know, it's, it's not going to make or break my practice. You know, this is just something I'm offering. It's, it's one of the, the great things about IR is the diversity of the procedures that we do. And it's it's an opportunity to help, but it doesn't make a, a huge difference in my personal practice. Right. And also like there are synergies, you know, so there are ways to grow this, especially with other specialists where there's overlap. 
it doesn't have to be competition or quote unquote turf. There are procedures that, that we can do to help patients who are not surgical candidates or to help improve their surgical outcomes or bridge to surgery or downstage to surgery. So once we educate our colleagues, there's a lot of room for synergy and, and working together. Yeah, I'm with you. So, you know, looking at this and going forward, you know, what further research or efforts do you think are needed to enhance the visibility and understanding of IR among the public, but also, you know, amongst the medical community? So, like I said, I think the good news is that research has shown that both patients and referring physicians are eager to learn about IR. So what can we do next? I think we need to investigate what's the best way to do that. So number one, I think understanding, you know, the relationships and how, how do we maintain those relationships? How can we raise awareness? How can we improve the education that our colleagues receive in their training and, and medical, even as early as medical school? What's the optimal approach? How to, how to deal with these? So this is the primary focus next. And I think Dealing with patients also, and you know, this research shows us that online presence and, and videos and things like that can go a long way. So how can we go about that? You know, what avenues can we handle? What's the most effective? How can we do this? How can we navigate our situation no matter what it is, right? Whether you're in a private practice or in academics, you have a big institution and how can you work with marketing? How can you show value to their institution so they can invest in these efforts? So there's a lot of research to be done. And I'm hoping that as we improve our awareness of the public, that we can empower the patients by giving them more options, and then hopefully we can translate in that into better outcomes. So there's one other thing that I wanted to talk about from your study, and it's a controversial topic, but you showed that the name matters. Tell me about that, what you saw in your study. Absolutely. Uh, what's in the name? So. One of the most interesting elements of our study was I wanted to understand how the name of the specialty affects the public's understanding of our specialty. So, you know, historically, this has been discussed in, in, in our specialty and revisited. And we wanted to understand, is the name IR or interventional radiology, is, is it confusing? or And if so, what would be a better name? So if you look back at the history, and this has been published in AGR a while back, Charles Dodder himself had some reservations regarding the name, and he believed that the term interventional is imperfect and did not accurately describe the work of interventional radiologists and may lead to confusion. So, yeah, exactly. So, to my knowledge, I believe there are a lot of people out there who have, you know, on social media platforms and things like that, changed the title of what they do. And some of the interesting ones out there are minimally invasive surgeon, minimally invasive image guided surgeon, vascular and interventional physician. And interventional physician, which is probably the one I like the least because, I mean, anybody who intervenes is an, intervention, an interventional physician, a urologist, a surgeon, that they're all intervening. It just doesn't distinguish us at all. No, absolutely. I'm sorry, Mike. Do you mind if I go back? Because I was going to add Please. a few things about the history and, yeah. and then we can go back to this because the SIR voted about it in 2003. And I think that could be helpful to share with the yeah, public. Yeah, please. Perfect. So I'm going to do this one more time. So. So one of the last elements to increase IR awareness, you know, has been historically to address, you know, what is an optimal name for us and then when whether interventional radiology is confusing to the public and what would be a better name for our specialty. And this is something I, I looked into because going back in history, Charles Dodder himself had reservations regarding the name. And he believed that the term interventional is imperfect and it doesn't accurately describe the work of IRs. And there is a lot of you know, there's pros and cons, and there are perceptions regarding the name among IR physicians and then IR colleagues that have been established over the years. You know, a lot of the practice building and assimilation within the medical community. And what is interesting is that the perceptions, you know, whether we have a brand recognition from, from our colleagues that were IR is one thing, but the perceptions among the, the public are different. So in our study, we addressed this by asking our thousand respondents you know, whether the name interventional radiology is misleading. And 55% said it may or may not be misleading. And those actually in healthcare or had experience in healthcare were more likely to say that this name is misleading compared to those without healthcare experience. So even the patients that know a little bit about the specialty, they don't think that the name really corresponds to their experience perhaps. And so then we asked them another question and we asked, okay, if, if IR is not the best name, from your perspective, what are the alternative names that you think would be better? And we give them options. We said minimally invasive surgeon. We said radiologic surgeon. We said surgical radiologist, interventionalist, procedure radiologist, minimally invasive radiologist, minimally invasive proceduralist, and 
interventional physician, and we even had other for them to pick. And if out of all those names, the most preferred name was a minimally invasive uh, radiologist. And I think at the end of the day, an ideal name should enable the establishment of a, a brand for us, so a more recognizable brand among the public. If we argue that interventional radiologists have three identities, right? We have, we're radiologists, we're surgeons, and we're clinicians. And this has been published by others in JVIR as, as what our identity is. We're radiologists, surgeons, and clinicians. A great name should really convey all aspects of our specialty. I don't think minimally invasive radiologist conveys all of that. I mean, aren't diagnostic radiologists the ultimate minimally invasive radiologist? They don't touch anybody. No, it's true, and I'm not. I'm not. I'm, I'm not advocating for for one of the names. I'm just sharing the data. I think the next, the the two others that were up high, also in terms of preferences, were procedural radiologists and radiological surgeon. I like those. I think those are good. I think those convey the the technical aspect of what we do. My least favorite is interventional physician. You know, you see people on social media. They a lot of people have, have changed their title in there. There's uh, minimally invasive image guided surgeon, minimally invasive image guided proceduralist, vascular and interventional physician, and interventional physician, which is probably the worst one because anybody who does any kind of procedure is an interventional physician. A, a surgeon is an interventional physician. It is a challenge. And I, I think one of the biggest challenges is if, if we were, and I don't know who would make this decision to decide as a specialty to undergo a name change is how you would, would do that, how you would change that name and and get it out there. You know, we struggle enough with recognition in the community. I think it's it's a it's an ongoing conversation that we should have. I think it's definitely not easy to to find the best name, and if if we even need to change it at this point. But I think you know perhaps as patients' awareness improves, this could be less of an issue. But it also could be something that we could do to help improve patients' awareness of what we do. It is definitely an issue, as we can tell from this research, that the patients think it it's confusing especially ones with healthcare background, which tells me that once they go see you in clinic and they see you do procedures and you manage them after and this and that, they're like, okay, so you're not really an intervention. Like you're more than just a radiologist because in their mind, they think, you know, a radiologist is just a physician that reads the imaging, if that. So I think more research should definitely look into this. And I think we should also continue the conversation. The last time our specialty discussed this was in 2003 when, when, when it was voted down. You know, now we have more of a clinical-based model. We have an interventional radiology residency. Our specialty matured and recognizes independent specialty. So maybe as we grow more, we can revisit that, whether that change is needed or not. I do think as we've grown, it is getting better. I think the word is trickling out, and I think recent efforts have helped with that. I think all the things that I've been called, the dumbest one was miniature radiologist. <laughs> Someone heard that wrong. That was a guy at the at the gym. Uh, that was that was definitely the the dumbest one. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> a, a, a mini IR. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a miniature radiologist. I'm just like a radiologist, but smaller. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's an interesting one. I haven't heard that one before, but I think it's funny. The guy wasn't the sharpest tool in the shed. Mina, how is the the rapid growth in IR procedures, especially over the last you know five years? affected both the medical communities and the public's perception of the field. So historically, the awareness of IR among the public has been poor. So just 20 years ago, 2% of the public was able to identify IR as a medical specialty in the literature. And in 2004, 50% of patients who underwent an IR procedure were unaware that an IR actually performed the procedure. Another study in 2007, only 29% of patients who underwent an IR procedure could describe the procedure adequately and that the fact that what happened to them. And then in 2023, in our study, we showed that 44% believed IRs to be physicians and less than 40% you know, believe that IR is a medical specialty. So although overall the, there's under-awareness and a lot of work needs to be done, I think overall the knowledge and recognition of our specialty is maturing. And again, I think this is partially at least to relate to the IR residency and more emphasis on the clinical model and more recognition and more growth in our, uh, in our procedures. Right on. So, you know, in your study, you suggest that primary care providers and educational videos could improve awareness of IR. How do you envision these methods being integrated into existing healthcare systems and, and what challenges might arise in their implementation? So both of these methods will require time and investments on a personal and institutional level, in my opinion. 
And so if you look at the first one, collaboration with PCPs, that will involve more education. So like I said before, lectures, grand rounds, multidisciplinary meetings. It really starts at the medical school and residency level, and then it continues after that in practice. I think we need to reach out and educate every time they send us a patient and use that as learning opportunity and an opportunity to build bridges. In some cases, when we do a good job, and not just procedurally, but also the the patient management and, and the communication and the care, patients go back and they're the biggest advocates for IR. And then if you look from the perspective of videos, so these could be simple videos or edu- or informationals on social media and our websites. I actually, last month, we published a study to address that question specifically in academic radiology. We, lo- we implemented uh, videos in our department and we used them to assess patients' outcomes. And we showed that IR procedure we show that the videos enhances the patient's understanding of IR procedures and IR care, and they actually resulted in higher patient satisfaction. So that's the next step of our work, and, and, and patients, not only they requested, but we're showing now that these things actually have an impact. And I think the other part of your question, which is you know the challenges, I think there's always going to be challenges in terms of time, financial investments, collaboration, navigating institutional processes if you're in large center. But I think if we can demonstrate you know, our value and our work. And we can show that, like I said, not only that patients need these things, but they also want to learn about IR. I think hopefully we can uh, gather momentum and continue raising awareness. Fantastic. Well, I look forward to your further research and your efforts to help get the word out. Mina, I think that's all I got. You got anything else that you want to talk about? No, I think this is fantastic, Mike. As always, you're awesome. And um, thank you again for the opportunity. And I'm really glad that uh, our work is is helping contribute to, to our understanding of the specialty. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, direct message us at at underscore Backtable on Instagram, Twitter, or LinkedIn. Backtable is produced and hosted by myself, Aaron Fritz, and co-hosts Chris Beck, Sabine Don, Michael Barraza, and Ali Behetti. Our audio team is led by Kieran Gannon with support from Aaron Bowles, Josh McWhorter, and Josh Spencer. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz. Social media and PR by Anne Dang, Manisha Naganathanahali, and Manbir Singh Sundu. Administrative support provided by Judy Delacruz. Thanks again for listening.